So uh, my name is Twin Shepherd, and I'm the technology manager at Mobile Guardian now. Most of you will know me as Edgy Geek, that tiger-faced bloke. Uh, or Mom G Tiger uh, is my other Twitter ID. Now, I've been active for a number of years um, looking around with data protection. I used to sit on the Vector uh, working group for data handling and information security. Anyone remember Vector? Yeah, okay. Believe it or not, they did actually produce some good stuff. And uh, I do point people at the materials that they did at data, around data protection, which are six, seven years old, but actually a lot of it is still relevant now. Um, Now, please note, I am not a lawyer, okay? Uh, and the information that's gathered, and gathered here today is stuff that has been out on the internet, it's from resources that are available, it's from um, materials from people like um, Joe Lady, who we'll talk about a bit later, and um, Charlie Stone, and, and conversations with folks like Mike and Shari. So this is all things that I'm trying to give to you to cut down some of your time to hunt for things as well. So but one thing I, I, I need to say is, it's a range, it's based on the range of experience from people within education. Okay, and that's first and foremost, which means that it should be more relevant and accessible to them. Okay. Um, the introduction of GDPR, it's a game changer. You will hear that phrase time and time again on blog posts, on materials, on webinars. Um, and as we get closer to the 25th of May 2018, less than a year now, okay, you will hear it on the news and you will hear it coming out more and more. But what does it mean? Well, if we think about how data and the use of it has expanded over the last few years even, um, we're looking at the expansion into the West and America. It's that wild west. It's, it's a case of everyone's going out there, I wouldn't say exactly lawless, but what laws there are, wouldn't really say that they follow that much. Would you say that that's the same amount of data protection for many of us? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's an unknown country for some folk, uh, and that's one of the things that we've got to think about. How's the West run? Now, Jonathan Bamford, who's at the ICO, um, actually came to this uh, during one of the sessions at Westminster Forums. Well, but what's the gas we're talking about? Um, because let's face it, schools haven't been really with data protection in the past. So saying, oh, we can't take our foot off the gas now, well, we're actually freewheeling anyway. Um, schools haven't even, don't even know where the petrol can be. Never mind fueling the car. Uh, so whilst there have been some schools that have signed undertakings because of problems that they've had, there hasn't been a single school fine yet. I mean, this is going back for quite a number of years, and there's a group of us that keep asking, have there been any fines yet? Have there been any more undertakings? And actually, very little gets done to schools. Local authorities, yeah, they get hit and hammered very hard, and they're going to find GDPR very painful. Academy groups have had concerns raised, but actually schools haven't been fined, so do we really need to do anything? Well, put it bluntly, if we're in the Wild West, we need a sheriff. Um, Yes, we might have already had that with the Data Protection Act, but now it's the US Marshals coming in. Um, and it's actually really important about why we're going to come in. And I'm not trying to scare you, but all the things that should have been done before now have to be done. But what does it actually change? So let's start with the new rights it gives individuals. Storing, processing, sharing, consent, remove and forget. Um, <coughs> now Jason Hart of Network World and IDG uh, recently reported that the breach level index found that 1,792 data breaches led to almost 1.4 million data records um, being lost in being compromised worldwide. That's an increase of 86% from 2015 to 2016. Personal data made up for 59% of those breaches. Okay? Data is where <coughs> things are being targeted at the moment. Okay? When OneCry went out, okay, it was the data systems that got most affected. Okay? 
So this is where we are all being hit. Uh, reporting. It's mandatory for data breaches, or will be. It's amazing to think it wasn't mandatory before. Um, you know, it, yes, there were in the public sector, there were lots of organizational and contractual obligations, um, but it wasn't mandatory. So you could be disciplined within your school for making a cock up. And actually, people weren't always reporting it to the ICO, still aren't reporting it to the ICO. Um, so, but now it's mandatory, like so many other statutory obligations about safeguarding and so on. And in the ICO's own guidance on 12 steps of the code code GDPR, um, it states that failure to report a breach can result in a fine, as well as the fine for the breach itself. It's a double whammy. That's why it's important to go, oh, it's not a problem. Because if you do get caught out, you do get fined out, it does happen, you will be hit twice as hard. Um, well, guess what? Guess how long? Have a guess. How long do you think you've got to report a data breach? Um, a month. Put your hands up if you think a month. A fortnight? A week? Five days? 72 hours. 72 hours. And it's not stipulated that those are working hours either. It is 72 hours. Sanctions, yes, they've increased too. So you've got, obviously, the written warning must still be in place, that's the undertaking. Um, you've got the regular periodic data audits. Um, now, the ICO does do data audits, audits and they do contract out. And if there's anyone who's ever worked for a company that's dealt with any form of information security standard or quality assurance standard, you'll know that audits can be a pain in the backside, external audits. And external audits rely on internal audits being done, which we all do, don't we? Deathly silence. Okay. Um, then you've got the next stage of the fines. So first level fines, um, 10 million euros up to 2% of annual turnover. Schools don't have a turnover. So, oh, 10 million euros. Oh, all this. Or actually, the proper level, which is what a lot of people are talking about, it's 20 million euros or 4% of annual turnover. Now you can just imagine if it's a company like, and I'm not saying that they have had data breaches, I must be clear about that, Apple, Google, or, or Microsoft maybe, but uh, with what they're doing with GDPR and all the other bits and pieces, actually I, I really like what's been done with Office 365, um, it's quite handy. But just imagine Apple, 4% of their annual turnover. That's what hefty five. That really, really is. Um, and I think, you know, it's whatever the greater is, is what they'll be fine. This is, again, a scale of those. Okay. Um, now, the thing that's relevant to most of us, third parties. Make sure that you use third parties which are GDPR compliant. Now, if you go to your suppliers now and say, are you GDPR compliant? What do you think the answer will be? What's GDPR? If, if any of them are saying, what's GDPR, you've got a bigger problem. Uh, most of all, we'll say, you know, the same as we do, we say, we're working on it, okay? And one of the reasons why we say we're working on it is because advice is still coming out from the um, legal body. So in, in, in the UK, it's the ICA. Advice is still coming out around it. So we can't turn around and go, Yes, we're GDPR compliant, because actually in a month's time, if a new bit of advice comes out, we might have to go, oh, well, we're not now. So, you know, anyone that turns around and says, we are right now, actually, they're saying we are at this point in time, but come the 25th of May 2018, it may be a slightly different picture. So, talk to your suppliers. Have conversations with them, have regular updates with them. Make sure that they're feeding information to you, um, about what they're doing and good practices you should be doing with their problems. Appoint a data protection officer. Okay, so I'm going to be a pain. Can everyone stand up, please? Come on. Come on. Okay. Sit down if you know who the CIRO is in your school. 
Sit down if you know who is legally responsible in your school for data protection. <laughs> okay, now you can sit down. Stand up if you're the person responsible. <laughs> okay? Are you members of senior leadership team? Yes. Okay? No? Okay, you can sit down. Go, run, quickly, run away! <laughs> okay. okay, right, so you can see, right, thank you, thank you very much. So you can see the, the problem we've got, okay? Where we don't even know who's handling the data protection within our school in the first place. We'll come on to that a bit more in a minute. Now, getting advice. So what we do, okay, there's lots of stuff out there to sift from. It's very business orientated because it's affecting business. Business wants to do things about it. They want to get it sorted because it affects their bottom line. So they're the ones that are out there doing things, finding advice. Um, quite often these discussions are in silos. Okay, so they will be in both three silos, not always joined up because we are not the base protection officer, it's the person that deals with strategy. <laughs> they're the ones that can join things together. If you've got one. Um, and the language. Often it's not relevant to us. It's the wrong audience, um, full of jargon. I mean, anyone, again, anyone who's done any of the ISO standards, you know how jargon filled it is. It's like Ofsted. Ofsted, almost Ofsted's materials is jargon. It's education jargon, but it's still jargon. Um, we all use jargon ourselves. We speak geek, um, teachers speak edulish, um, mm -hmm. people in senior, senior leadership speak manglement speak. Um, yeah, uh, yeah Mandelman, it is the right word, believe me, for something that is the right word. So, we, it's jargon, and we have to try and get information to us in the appropriate language. There are some good bits of advice out there, um, and this is where we all need to say a massive thank you to some of those people over the last few months that have joined in the conversations on the forum. Um, now, first and foremost, the ICO is always going to be the people to go and have a look at in the materials. Okay, they are getting a lot better with doing education friendly materials. Admittedly, a lot of it is aimed at senior leadership and local authorities. They are trying to improve that, but we'll see how that goes. There are things out there, I mean, I have to admit, Peerless is really, really good, and there's a fantastic wiki on there which has a range of articles, some about leadership, some about strategy, some about technology, some about encryption. So there's some stuff in there that's good. IT governance, very business orientated, and to be honest, they're a commercial company that sells training and other bits and pieces, but they do a number of free webinars, and it's always good to have a look on there. If nothing else, they do a lot of the facts and figures for you to give you evidence to take a look at your team. And then I also have to say the GDPR and schools group. Um, so uh, Lynn is here with Alex. So Lynn, uh, Lynn Taylor, a mature lady. Um, Sorry. <laughs> on the site. <laughs> on the site there, uh, Edgy Lee Handler's mature lady. Um, so, Lynn was the founder of Parent Pay, and with uh, a partner in crime, uh, Lars Royston, who's the MD and founder of Root Call, they've actually put together GDPR on schools. So, this is actually a site with a lot of free resources. There'll be some other commercial stuff coming on later on. <coughs> but it's about giving advice to schools in language that's suitable to schools. Okay? It's about working with all the suppliers, the MIS suppliers out there to get all those data mappings and all the other bits and pieces. So that's probably going to be one of your best resources that you can go to. Uh, there'll be some flyers that are uh, a back or around that we'll hand out later on as well that you can have a look through and take back to your senior leadership team. Um, one of the things on the ICO site, there's actually a good checklist which can easily move into a spreadsheet so that you can, if you're like me, like color coding and ragging about how you're progressing along things, you can actually do that. Or your data protection officer can do that. Now the 12 steps. Um, so this is based on materials from the ICO, some materials from online, also from GDPR schools. These are the 12 steps you need to take. Okay, okay that's my session finished, and I'll, you want more information? <laughs> you like more information? Okay. I've got a question, um, Carl, okay. How will they find schools and public organizations that don't make money in a space like tunnel? They'll remove money from their budgets. Just remove money from budgets. So. It's what they do with um, local authorities. They already do it. They find local authorities. Local authorities find money that they have to hand back, and um, all gets removed from their budgets. Okay, awareness. Um, I apologise if I read any of the bits and pieces from the screens. I try not to do too much of it because it's annoying. 
Now, it is important to get chief decision makers to be aware that the law is changing. It's law, okay? It's not some fancy political ideal that's coming in that will change if a government changes or anything like that, or if a minister changes. It's law. Okay. Governors, okay? Governors can be a fantastic resource for you. Governors deal, if anyone is a governor here, anyone a governor? Okay, you deal with strategy in the school, you don't deal with operational. GDPR is operational, but you need to have oversight to make sure it is being handled. The same way you do with any other policy or any other set of procedures within the school. Okay, governors should be asking questions about this right now. There are some governor organisations like Modern Governor and NGA who are starting to get information out to governors. Make sure your school is aware. If you're not a governor, get find out who the governor would be that deals with information security or anything like that. Safeguarding, whoever's dealing with safeguarding will probably be your first port of call. The school needs to appreciate the impact it will have. Information you hold. Um, now, this includes a heck of a lot of information. Um, there's, uh, who here has actually done a data audit? In the, in, in the school, yeah? Okay. Was it a nice, quick, easy job? Yeah. And that's the perfect example. Perfect answer, actually. I'll tell you when I'm finished. Because guess what? You're never finished. Okay, um, life cycle management. It, it's one of those things where as soon as you've done it, you've got the data sets and the other information in, you will have a schedule to go through, review, update, communicate, and all the other bits and pieces. Okay, it's never finished. It's the fourth road bridge, the yeah, fourth bridge. Um, you just keep going. And that's what you're meant to do because data always changes. Um, we also have to admit, so, so many schools are so far behind with what they do with data, you're not at the point of, oh, we're going to have a schedule to do a review. You're actually starting from scratch. You really, really are. Um, review privacy notices. Okay. Yes, the department should be updating their advice. In the meantime, the ICO's code practice is a cracking place to start. Even for what you're doing at the moment, it's a cracking place to start. Okay? There may be times when the DFE's advice differs from the ICO's advice. Um, the ICO's advice is probably the one that you should have a bit more weighting towards because, hey, the, the statutory body in the country, in the UK. Um, but it's one of those things where make sure you keep up to date with what's going on with the DFE. Procedures to ensure that you cover all individuals' rights, including how to delete personal data. Now, that's actually quite a tricky one because there are other obligations you have to retain data. And again, further advice is needed from the ICO and the DFA around these things. That's why I'm saying nobody has a whole complete picture right now. It is going to change over the coming months and over the rest of the year. Public interest, okay? Now, if you go onto the article um, on the ICO's website, you actually go to it and you have a look, you all can see some of the articles referred to in subsections and subsections. Okay? And that will actually give you the exact wording. Well, let me stick up on here. There is data that is public interest. Okay? And so data that is public interest has to be recorded and will be recorded in a particular way. Okay? And the Act gives you information around that. You will need to provide information to people when students leave. They will, you will start having them asking for information, and you will need to be able to have commonly used formats that you can easily get things into. That's one of the things you've got to start thinking about between now and when the act comes in. How will you give students their data? How will you give teachers their data? Okay. Individual rights. This is a list of the rights. You can see where there's going to be some conflicts straight away. Um, data portability. Okay, this is for personal data, remember. Okay, so we're not talking about e-portfolios. 
Some parts of your portfolios may be personal, some may not. So actually, you might have to work about what you're doing educationally around the portfolios in general. Well, this is not a time of curriculum stuff. How many of here deal with curriculum matters and directing how you do things with the curriculum? Not that many of us. The right to restrict processing. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting one I'll come on to that when we look at children in a minute. Um, automatic decision making, including profiling. Um, there is a query. Does this mean behavior management? And actually whether you're using data on behavior to automatically flag behavior of particular students? I, I don't know. It's one of those things that it's a question that's out there. No one answered it at the moment. Um, that's one of the things that you need to talk with your MIS providers who are handling your behavior management data about what they're doing to help you with that. Subject access requests. Obviously, you've all got procedures about handling subject access requests at the moment, haven't you? Okay. Um, subject access requests, like freedom of information uh, requests, have to be handled. There has to be a procedure in the school. That's a requirement at the moment. So that needs to be looked at and reviewed. If you have never read or any of those, go and read them. Go and find out what the policies are. Find out what should be happening if something happens. You may be, you know, someone comes along to you and say, I need this, 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 and this, and you're never given the background behind the procedure because you don't need to know you're just the person clicking on the buttons and getting the emails out. Actually, you should understand the full procedure. Um, now, subject access requests are important around individual rights that we came to show earlier on. The language around this is important as well. So when you're providing the data from a subject access request, again, it's these commonly used formats. So it's not, you don't, these aren't just individual silos. These are all linked together. Legal basis for processing data. Um, now, this comes back to your data audit again. You, obviously, we've got stuff that comes under the public uh, interest umbrella. You've got to find out what isn't on the public interest umbrella. Document it. Make sure it's being processed locally. Okay? Um, and what's being used to make sure that the school can function. So it might not be public interest, but it allows the school to function. Okay? Know what you have. Know why you have it. Know what you're doing with it and know who is doing things with it. Okay? Now, if nothing else, if you take those four things away, those are probably the most important questions you've got on the data order. Okay? When you actually get into information handling, you start looking at confidentiality, integrity, and accessibility. That's actually quite a wide picture to some extent. Probably most of you won't end up doing that to start off with, but it will be something that's needed as more information and recommendations come along. Now, one of the things that I do need to say here is that we're not talking about whether it's right or wrong to process this data, okay? Most of the stuff that we're looking at here, we're looking at stuff that where there are instructions to process it because the requirements either for data to go into central government or to be managed within your school. Um, so the legal requirements or the instructions to process data that have come from senior management or even from the trust um, but if you're in a water county trust or in the local authority, so any other concerns that you have around operational concerns, is the data being handled as the procedures and all the other bits and pieces, you should have procedures in place to handle that so that you can actually escalate any concerns that you've got. So when we talk about the legal side of things, we're not talking about whether politically, whether it's right or wrong, if data goes from one company to another company, you know. Fisher Family Trust do fantastic bits of work with data, but other companies may be using it for profit. We're not talking about that. We are purely talking about your legal requirements in the school. Consent. Um, now, any data not processed, so you've already done your audit, and you know what's not on the public interest, okay? Consent. Now, how many people here, and remember the camera's on me so no one can see you, have got consent by admission operating in your school. So a letter goes home and say, unless you tick here, the photo will be used for this, that, and the other. How many people have got that sort of situation? Well, guess what? You'll hear phrases like active consent, 
you'll hear phrases like um, um, mandatory obligation and things like that. It all basically means you can't presume that consent is given. Consent has to be asked for and granted. If you've got any data that's being held at the moment, that's not in public interest, that you've done consent by admission, guess what? You've got to go out and ask again. That's <laughs> going to be a lovely exercise for us all, isn't it? Um, yeah, so you need to check existing records to see when new consent is required. You also got to work out your pattern of consent. So do you ask once for the whole of the period of life the child is in school? There's a problem with that, which we'll see in a minute. Or do you ask on, a, on an annual basis? What's going to annoy parents most? Okay, children. Now, we already know children's ages. Okay, that's one of the pieces of uh, uh, information that has to come in, we have to have. Now, you gather parental or guardian consent for data processing. You have to continue doing that. But um, look at this one. You know, who can spot the student in your school, you know who that student is, who can spot the student that's going to turn around and say, no, nope, I don't want you sharing data with my parents. <laughs> yeah? yeah? It's going to happen. The other, one of the other questions I've got, again, I don't know the answer for you. It's something we've got to ask suppliers. And what is it a case of we can or actually ask the ICO is probably going to be the best one. Is it a case of consent can be granted by that child before they're 16? So maybe when they're 15 and a half, or you know, when they start year 11, you know, they give their consent then. But on their 16th, so can they legally give that consent? Or does it have to be on their 16th birthday? So have you got to walk into the choosing room, put the notes on their desk, get the child to sign it, and then walk off? Is that what's going to be? Is it going to be that? Uh, absence notices which automatically get sent out to parents when a child's not in school. Do you have to pause that for year 11 until you've got a signature to say, yes, it can be sent out because my child is over 16 now. But yeah, that's probably the way it's going to have to be. So it's things like this that we need to have a look at, see what our suppliers are doing and everything. Quick question? Do we know if it's going to be allowed to make consent a prerequisite and attendance? So if, if they don't give consent, we can say, well, you're not attending school. Um, you, uh, that would have to be something that your senior leadership team ask a lawyer who's paid a heck of a lot of money to answer. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it's like behavior. Um, there are processes in place to deal with behavior so that if a child doesn't follow certain things, they get excluded. Now, it would be a very brave school that says, if you don't allow us to process your data in the way that we demand, you're not going to come here. It's going to be a very brave school. There will be some, probably, the same way that some say you have to have to use biometrics to access catering and, and things like that. Um, and that seems to all change the bound of it. You know, it's no longer, I don't think there's any school that says you have to use our biometric system anymore. If they are, they are brave, and I use that word brave the same way that a civil servant would advise a minister. That's a big choice, minister. Um, so, yeah, that's one for legal data to answer. Okay. Uh, now, yeah, the other thing, any systems where students have put their information online? Well, they do it in lots of places, but that's where they do it on behalf of the school. They do it as part of their school activities. So anything that you can do where you are processing the data that goes online for them as part of your consent, as part of your data audit and all the other bits and pieces that you're in control of, you know where it's happening. So you can see getting students to sign up for things themselves is going to drift away. So that's where folk like Microsoft and Google with their single sign-on services are going to become very, very important and you need to ask them how they're managing their data on your behalf. Data breaches. Um, you should have correct procedures in place already for data breaches, don't you? It's the tumbleweed again, it's the wild west, isn't it? Um, now, you have to familiarize yourself with these. You have to update the procedures because it's a mandatory to afford data breaches and all the other bits and pieces. Um, and then you've got to train staff 
Who's going to train staff? Put your hand up if you think it's going to be you. Yeah, okay. I'll be honest with you, you probably will get lumbered with a job. It should be the data protection officer. They may delegate it, but they're the person that should actually be controlling who does the training, what they're trained on, and all the other bits and pieces. Um, yeah, and also, there's that best practice from Vector in the past. If you don't have procedures there at the moment around data breaches, go and have a look at the National Web Archive. Okay, have a look at the Vector materials, familiarize yourself with them, give yourself a starting point at least. Okay, go and wait and do that. Um, now, the training and telling teachers, you're going to have to do this, this, and this now. Some unions aren't going to be happy about that because this is going to be changing some of the working conditions for teachers. Unions haven't really responded yet to what GDPR is going to mean for their members. So that's one of the other things that the data protection officer and the head teacher is going to have to have a look at. Okay? Because you can understand that the DPO is going to have quite a significant weight if there's a failure in any of the processes. The same sort of safeguarding. Now, data protection by design, so security by design and privacy by design, those are phrases that your suppliers should be saying to you. So any of your suppliers that have done things such as Cyber Central, Cyber Central Plus, I say 27,001 or any of the others in the 27,000 series, they will be working on the basis of um, security and privacy by design. And they're really good things to look at for when you're talking with suppliers. Um, become familiar with privacy impact assessments. This is part of your data audit. When anything new comes on, on online within your school, whenever you're working with a new system, whenever a teacher says, ah, we've got this field or we've got this system that we want to incorporate in. A risk assessment effectively has to be done on all of these. Okay? Um, yeah, so talk to your suppliers and see how their product is compliant or will help you with your compliance. Data protection officers, schools are public bodies. It is compulsory, it's mandatory. They have to have one. They can share one. So in a, uh, a trust setting, there might be one across the trust. It might be that you purchase somebody in to do that job for you, the same way that you might buy in a um, psychiatrist, uh, you know, a, a, a child psycho and psych specialist, okay? But that doesn't mean that it's, they have to do everything. In the same way as safeguarding, it is everyone's responsibility. Um, which obviously makes everybody happy because it's more work. Um, now, it's important to see where the role sits within your school, and it's important to see where it fits within the governance procedures. Again, speak to your governors, because they're the ones that oversee the governance. Um, sharing the DPO with other schools. Other thing to remember is that the DPO is not the person that is um, liable, okay? It's the school. The school's the organisation that's liable, not the DPA. The other thing you have to remember is the DPO is the person with oversight of GDPR, as I said earlier. Not necessarily the person that operationally does things on a day-to-day -day basis. You might operationally do things, you might have white policies, you might have white procedures, but the DPO is the person that, they're the ones that hold the <coughs> to account. They're the ones that raise the competency questions. They're the ones that could initiate disciplinary procedures. Again, the unions, if that's not a senior leadership role, the unions are probably not going to be too happy about that. That's not to say that network managers can't do it. It's just that they should have written into their job spec significant authority for doing this role. It has to be written in there. It's not a, and any other uh, activities that the head deems fit. It actually has, it should, it really, really has to be, it has to be written in there and it has to be followed up by where it sits within governments and all the other procedures. International, so if you are in a school that's part of an international group, um, sorry, in a, uh, a public school system or a private school group, uh, and you've got schools overseas and everything, 
The responsibility for GDPR sits with your main establishment. So if you've got 13 schools in your group, nine of them in the UK, okay, you're responsible to the UK legal body, the ICO. If you've got one school in the UK and 17 in France, it'll be France. That's the way it works. Okay? One of the other things I need to say about international. Now, G stands for general within the regulations. Realistically, it stands for global because this is a standard that's now being looked at across the world as, well, actually, yeah, this is what we all need to be doing. So when you're talking with companies, I mean, if you take you know, Microsoft and Google again, the mod EU model clauses, they don't use things like privacy shield or you know, things like that, or um, they've gone down the model clauses route because it's so much better. And that's the way that other companies are going now because international compliance is better than just a country or the EU. So that's what that's where things are going. So international migration of data, it's going to be less a question of, oh, well, the data centers in the UK, or the data centers in the EU, but moving into the UK, it's going to be more about what's the compliance, how is it handled, who handles it, what processes does that company in place, what standards does that company follow? Okay. But with regards to international, within the 12 steps, that's about where is your main body, which legal body are you responsible to? For most of us, it will be the ICO. Um, so, there you are, quick review of the 12 steps. Next steps for us, okay, even slimming down even further, someone has to take ownership. Keep calm, I plan. We've got nearly a year yet. That's plenty of time, surely. Um, communication in plain English. Privacy notices now have to be in plain English anyway. They've got to be something that's understandable by the sub data subject. Audit and ensure you justify what is going on. Okay, if you can justify it and it fits within legal requirements, then yeah, by all means, use the data process the data. If you're just collecting data because oh, it seems like a good thing to collect, we may need it in the future, do you think that's acceptable? No, you've got to have a reason to process. Talk with your suppliers and also make sure you keep an eye out for further advice and guidance. ICO's website, uh, gdpr.schools, places like that. So that's a whistle stop tour, really is a whistle stop. There's a heck of a lot more to fit in there. Uh, we've got a bit of time now for some QA. Uh, we've got Alex, who's from GDPR and Schools as well, who can answer any questions as well, any additional questions that you've got. So, first question, please. The answer to that is yes, they do. Um, I asked the question and I told that exact question. And they, their answer, as I call it, the ICO's quest answers are, are very woolly. Um, they do say that any data, and they keep specifying any data that is stored related to a subject can be accessed by an individual. They also say that if that becomes excessive, then you can actually go back to the subject asset and say that is excessive. Uh, I am aware of one private school company that has been asked that very question already, and it actually took somebody three days to access all the emails to actually send to that, who happened to be a top lawyer, uh, and so they felt they had to do it. Also remember that when you're sending that information out as a subject access request, it has to be redacted so you don't hand out other personal information for other subjects. And that, believe it or not, is one of the things that takes the most time, is the redaction. Um, that's why, well, at least that's what's the excuse that some government departments give anyway. Uh, okay. Yep? No, there's a question, about uh, a lot of patients that one of the things that we're really want to do is put their child into 16, they can work respectively. Well, it, so when they are 16, yeah, you have to ask them for consent for their data again. It's not that they are retrospectively knocking it off, it's a case of they are then the controller as the, uh, for them as a data subject. 
Yeah. So it's not perspective work. You've got to effectively start from scratch. So does it mean they can, does it mean that they can request that anything that's being held about them might have date and perhaps the date might actually have to be removed? Yeah, because, well, the removal yeah. is one of those questionable things yeah. because there are certain yeah. things that cannot be removed yeah. because of uh, public interest and also because of other regulations of retention. So um, it means things like IP address. IP address is personal data because it's trackable. So if a student wants to say, actually, I want to have all logs of what I've been looking at on the internet removed, then actually that's quite an understandable thing to request. Okay? So if you don't have a way of tying them as an individual to what they've been accessing, well, actually, you don't know who it is. So that's anonymized data anyway, so that's not a problem. If you do have a track of who's been accessing what, so if you've got your single sign on the time that they day with your smooth wall or other devices, um, then yeah, you can track down who it was, where they were, what they were doing. Maybe that's some of that information you do retain because it's pertinent to other uh, issues that are going on around safeguarding, around behavior management, and other bits and pieces. So even if they do ask to delete it, there may be things that you don't delete. And further advice will come out in time, we hope. I think the key of the whole thing is is the, the, the words uh, legal processing of data and that is you need to have a legal reason to process data and we will find in schools that an awful lot of our reason for processing data comes under the, the public umbrella and as such that is data that we need to process within schools and therefore they do not have the right to have that removed or, or so forth. And, and I think that's going to become clearer and clearer over the years. <coughs> there will be some information like a parent gives an email address. They could ask for that to be removed unless you can justify you need that email address as an emergency contact. Yeah. And so it's very grey in the area. I'm sorry, sorry. I just think actually we're talking about children here. What about staff? They're logging in staff to think that needs to well, you do on the safeguarding and employment. So, um, if you keep a log and process data on access on the internet as part of competence, so when were they accessing things on the internet? Should they have been teaching at that time? So, maybe that you're keeping historical records for that sort of reason. Um, and, and there are things that you do still need to process because it fulfills your safeguarding obligations. So there's things like that where, yes, you will have staff that say, um, or unions that say you need to delete stuff, um, but actually you then need to go back and get legal advice or check on the ICA to see whether they do have that right or not. I'd like to say that all data is, is covered by GDPR. And therefore, if someone is keeping a record of um, the, the PTO, the PTA in your school on on the system, maybe a, there may be a system that does that, then that is still subject to, to the data audits that you should be doing. It's all data, not just, and it's not all on your servers. It's stuff in filing cabinets. It's all data, anything where an individual could be identified. Have you had much communication with Capita about? how it impacts data retention in the sims. Um, I spoke to them, well, tried to speak to them about um, how sims handle data retention because I think some companies now are seeing this as an opportunity to block schools or stuff. You know, buy our system because otherwise GDPR is going to mean that you've got a load of stuff that you're storing in the wrong place and you'll get fined. Um, I can't help thinking there's going to be a lot of us as GDPR comes in where if we're storing stuff in sims, would we be saying, well, hang on, you know, this is capital provides this as the school's information management system, if it's not for the purpose of GDPR, uh, then this should be capital's problem. Uh, do you have any recommendations with them about this? Well, I, I know the answer to yeah, that. Yeah, it's a <laughs> um, uh, Capita, I know, are currently working to make their software absolutely fully. GDPR compliant. I asked for charging you more. I'm sorry, I, I wouldn't like to go there. I happened to be in Capita on Monday uh, talking about it, and I'm more than happy to feed back any information I gain yeah, from them on that. It's primarily the if you're using the document 
management tells them to the way you're tagging the records. Yeah. Just to give you an but at the moment, there's no kind of data retention period, so everything that you stick in there just stays in there forever. There's no kind of facility to say, well, this is such and such a document that's got to stay for seven years, this is such and such that's got to stay forever. So that's, yeah. but that's, that's where other organisations are trying to flog you very expensive systems yeah. at the moment based on the terror of GDPR coming. Yeah, and had to go back to conversations in 2008 to 2011 around information security and data handling that Vector was dealing with. Um, they were never fully resolved. Um, most of the MIAS companies have been pretty good with what they've done so far, um, but because of the change in the law, everybody's got to redo stuff. Um, there doesn't seem to be anybody uh, apart, apart from Linen Lawrence, who's actually pressing the MIS providers at the moment. Um, there's some folk who are, uh, I mean, we've, we've got Jen here who's challenging the DFE on a number of things about what advice they're giving around data retention and how data is being used. Um, so it's one of those things we have to wait for further advice from them. I think perhaps also you asked, is, does that become a capitalist problem because they're holding the data? But it's, it's not. It's, your problem because you're the controller, it's your responsibility to safeguard that data. So the risk remains with you if anything happened to that data and it got destroyed or, or leaked or whatever. Uh, so so you'd have to at this point record it as a risk and treat it as a risk and, and talk to capital what they can do about it. Can you transfer it to them? I mean can they give you an insurance against it? You know, there are ways probably to treat the risk, but it is your yeah. It also raises questions about how it is data stored within your network as well as within the cloud. Is it transferred and a secure connection within the cloud? Within your network, is it held encrypted or on devices with encryption? So those are all sorts of things that you need to have within your world. So there's a book. Yeah. Um, so there's a sorry, going back to the 16-year-old Yeah, so 16-year-old. I, yeah, I was reading the ICO website the other day for the data protection commission and there is an advice guideline, it is just a guideline, that is for parents with risk information from a child um, aged 12 or above that you are expected to give permission from a child as well. It's 16M6C. It, it, yes, it will do because it's a change in the law. So the over 12 comes from the EU data protection regulations which generates the Data Protection Act. And it said, uh, the actual regulations say over 12. Most companies take that as 13, which is actually the US requirement, um, but in the EU it's over 12. It's never been worked out whether that's 12 years and one day, or whether that's 13, um, so most people treat it as 13. Um, any of the requirements and the guidelines like that are being superseded by the GDPR uh, advice. Although not to frighten everyone, gee, the, the, on the ICO side they say they are contemplating dropping the age limit to 30. They're only contemplating it. Yeah, okay. So as I said, <laughs> ad, <coughs> advice is, yeah. so as I said, advice is being changed. No one can say that they can give you complete advice about being compliant because it's likely to change. Keep an eye on things. Okay, so I think that's my time is up. If you've got any other questions, um, or before we get before you go, there'll be uh, leaflets with advice and guidance about the twelve steps, so you can pick that up and take that back to your senior leadership in your schools. Okay, and um, thank you very much. Thank you.